I don't think I would have looked on the shores of the Sea of Galilee to find the disciples who would follow me and would one day be sent out. I'd go to Jerusalem. I'd go to find the religious leaders, the people who were respected, the ones who knew the most about Scripture. I would have chosen them to follow me and then to send them out. But I'm not Jesus. Not by a long shot, and neither are you. Instead, Jesus chooses the most unlikely, the least qualified, Fisher, and he sends them out. That's the focus of our worship this morning. May the Holy Spirit fill you with confidence in Christ as your Savior from sin, and with that confidence, the ability to follow him and to share his word with others. So good morning and a welcome to all of you. If you're using your hymnal for today's order of worship, we begin on page 38. Let's join now in the opening hymn.
please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And it also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is number 67. Listen as an introduction is played, and then we'll join together in singing the refrain and the verses of the psalm.
Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10. It's the will of God that all people hear his word. For that to happen, messengers must be called and sent. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ, the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, my mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long. Hallelujah. Jesus is who he says he is. Peter, James, and John left their fishing and became fishers of men. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from, the, from shore. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. talk to your grandma? All right. If you want to talk to someone and they're not there, you can pick up a telephone like this one or a cell phone like your mom or your dad has and you can talk with them. Have you ever wanted to talk to God? Or do you think God wants sometimes to talk to you? Well, has the phone ever rung and you answer the phone and, hello, it's God. He doesn't do that, does he? God doesn't use the telephone. There were times in the Bible that he used special messengers. We heard about one in the reading from Isaiah. The Bible talks there about seraphs, which are angels. We'll talk about that in a, little, in a minute. Angels like this one. This is a treetop angel from the Christmas tree. Remember, they were up in front here about a month ago or a little less. God used angels. Mm -hmm. They have wings, yeah. And they're powerful and they're holy. 
And God wanted to, Isaiah to know something, and the angels shared that with him about how holy God is. And then the Lord shared his word with Isaiah. He said, Isaiah, I want you to go and be my messenger. I want you to go and share God's word with other people. When we want to know what God has to say to us, we have the Bible. We can look in the Word of God and see there what God has to say. And the thing that's most important of all, that's a rather big book, isn't it? The most important thing of all is that we're sinful people. And we deserve to be punished forever because of our sins. That's a terrible thing, but God did something about that. He sent Jesus to be your Savior and mine, the whole world's Savior. You know how Jesus was always right always holy, and then he suffered and died. And then he rose again, so that we are forgiven and have eternal life. That's what God wants us to know, and that's what he wants everyone to know. And so he gives you and me his word, not only for us to believe, but a word also that we should share with other people. And God talks about that with us this morning in his word. Okay, you go back and sit with your parents. We'll sing the hymn of the day, number 573.
and they polled some of those people who had changed positions during the year, and they did so for varying reasons. Some said it was for better pay. Others said they were dissatisfied with the position they had, so they were looking for something else. Still others, almost all of them, said that it was due to, in part at least, to COVID. But no doubt every one of them at least pondered for a while what they were doing and the gifts that they had, the opportunities that they had, and the requirements or the suggested skills that this opening had, and asked themselves, do I have what it takes? And in those situations where they accepted that new position, obviously they came to the conclusion, yes, I do. I'm going to go for that other position. Do I have what it takes? is an important question to ask yourself when entering into an endeavor. Because if you get into one of them and you don't have what it takes, it only sets you up for frustration in the opening weeks and months of that new position. Do I have what it takes? In this morning's scripture readings, we hear how our Lord uncovers his messengers. In today's gospel, we heard how Jesus called average fishermen out on a lake to come and follow him. His intent was that he was going to send them out into the world with his saving gospel, the most critical position of all. I wonder as they prepared for this sending out, if they asked themselves from time to time, do I have what it takes? I'm guessing they did, probably more than once. And that's nothing new. It was happening even among God's prophets in the Old Testament. We have an example of it to hear this morning before us in the words of Isaiah chapter six. Isaiah didn't know if he had what it took to be God's messenger. In fact, he came to the conclusion that he wasn't fit. He was unworthy. One of the truths of our Christian faith is that the Lord calls each and every one of us to follow him. And one of the reasons he does so is that he can send us out with his message. It's one of those truths that we conveniently try not to think about too often because we're not sure that we're just fit for this. We don't know if we have what it takes. But before we ask that question, let's see what the requirements are. What does it take to be a gospel proclaimer? Let's keep that question in front of our hearts and our minds as we focus on this portion of God's word from Isaiah chapter six. I've hoped you've noticed something about each and every person in our world. Everyone has at least one problem. Most people have all sorts of problems. Pretensions aside, no one has it all together. Everyone needs help. Everyone needs fixing to some degree or another. And therapists would tell you that admitting that is the first step in getting the help that you need. From Isaiah's conversation with the Lord, we know that he was painfully aware that he had problems, that he needed fixing. The Lord appeared to him probably in a vision and Isaiah was immediately confronted with his biggest problem of all, that he was a sinful man and he lived among sinful people and here was the Holy Lord Almighty. The Gospel writer John informs us that the Lord here was none other than the Son of God himself. In this vision, Isaiah saw the Son of God sitting on a throne. That's an obvious depiction of the Son of God with his almighty power ruling over all things as King of kings and Lord of lords. Isaiah informs us that there were seraphs flying above the Lord. This is the only time we meet that word in Scripture. They were most likely angels, probably an elite portion of the angels. And they had six wings. Isaiah informs us with two of them, they covered their faces, and with two of them, they covered their feet. Obvious acts of humility when they were standing in the presence of the Holy Son of God. Even these holy angels realized they were nothing compared to the eternal Son of God. And they used their voices. 
and Isaiah heard their voices. And the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Incredible. Imagine seeing and hearing what Isaiah heard and saw. And Isaiah's reaction was nothing unexpected. He cried out, woe to me, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The seraphs stood in the presence of the Lord, whose essence was holiness, and declared how holy the Lord was. Isaiah, at that moment, was confronted with one incredible problem, his sinfulness. And the fact that his sinfulness could not stand in the presence of the Holy Lord. His sinfulness demanded separation from God, eternally so. Isaiah was impressed with that to the point that he lived, he was in utter despair. He figured he was ruined. That was something that only the Lord could take care of for him. And he showed it to Isaiah in a graphic way. One of the seraphs flew to the altar and with the tongs took a glowing ember, coal, and took it back and touched Isaiah's mouth. That altar in the temple was where the sacrifices were made, sacrifices for the sins of the people. What the Lord here illustrated for Isaiah was the forgiveness that only the Lord can provide, a forgiveness which purified Isaiah, enabling him to be one of his messengers. And there's the point for you and me this morning. What does it take to be a gospel proclaimer? It takes purification, divine purification, purification that only our God can provide for us. I think it's safe to say that none of us have ever been confronted with the Lord's holiness in the way that Isaiah was here on this day in his life. But maybe we should be. Maybe it's unfortunate that we are confronted with God's holiness like Isaiah was here. Because I'm guessing that sinfulness is just something we've learned to accept about ourselves. In fact, we'd be willing to say, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm better than other people are. I'm fine the way I am. We forget the fact that our sinfulness demands punishment from God, that it separates us from God. And so a, a display of God's holiness like this might bring us to our knees as it did Isaiah. The holiness of God shining in our hearts and in our minds, revealing our laziness, our sinful pride, our critical judgment of others our propensity for pushing God to the edges of our lives rather than pulling him into the center. That's what the holiness of God would reveal about me and about you. And then God does what he wants to do, what he's all about doing, and that is purifying us through the blood of Jesus Christ. He announces to us our forgiveness, a forgiveness which Christ won by leaving that throne in heaven and taking on our human flesh and blood and sacrificing his holy life for your sins and mine, the sins of the world. Our God purifies us. What does it take to be a gospel proclaimer? It takes divine purification, a purification that is yours, that you live in every day of your life by faith in Jesus Christ. Isaiah received the assurance of his forgiveness in a dramatic way here in chapter 6 of his book. And having been purified, Isaiah was ready and eager for service in God's kingdom. This was his response to the forgiveness God provided for him. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The Lord had chosen Isaiah to be his messenger at a critical time for a critical purpose. By and large, the Jews at this time had forsaken the Lord. They had turned their backs on him. And God was at his wit's end with what to do with his people. He came to the conclusion that the only thing he could do was to bring about judgment and then exile. 
He would discipline his people in order to refine his people. And what he needed was a messenger, someone to go and to proclaim to them what God was going to do, the judgments that were coming, to call those people to repentance and to faith in the God of their salvation. That was Isaiah's message. A message the people desperately needed to hear and believe. And so when the Lord called Isaiah to serve, he jumped at the chance. Isaiah had been purified by the Lord. He had the forgiveness that he so desperately needed, a forgiveness that only God could provide for him. And so Isaiah realized that even though his task would be difficult, that his God would go with him and enable him to speak the words that were necessary for his people to hear. Words of condemnation, but also words of forgiveness, of purification through the God of their salvation. Isaiah went. The next 60 chapters of his book explain the words that he spoke. And as he did so, I wonder if Isaiah ever had this question. Why doesn't God send his angels to proclaim this word that he has given me to proclaim? After all, Isaiah had witnessed these seraphs proclaiming God's word in such an emphatic and profound way. Why not send angels, Lord, to do this work? They're holy. They're powerful. They could do a much better job than Isaiah could. But a suggestion like that forgets one thing. Holy angels know nothing of the forgiveness that comes only from God. Holy angels know nothing about the fear of death, the fear that's only overcome by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Holy angels know nothing about the burden of guilt and the relief that God's forgiveness brings. But sinful, believing people do. What does it take to be a gospel proclaimer? It takes the motivation that only the gospel can give. <clears throat> you know all those blessings, the forgiveness, the relief from guilt, the confidence that you can have even in the face of death because your Savior died and rose again and lives eternally. You know those things. You believe those things. Those truths fill your heart. What does it take to be a gospel proclaimer? Gospel motivation. The very gospel God has placed into your heart. We've got an entire world that needs to hear that message. Let's get busy. And as we proclaim that gospel, we can count on God to bless us. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We now join in confessing the Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing as the offering is brought forward. Forgiven, free of guilt and shame, grant me some time to render a gift to glorify your name, love to reflect your splendor. This world must know what I have learned, that you bestow what none has earned, the joy of full forgiveness. Amen. Please join me now in the responsive prayer of the Church for Epiphany. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Mary's Son, 
In the fullness of time, you came into our world to save us from sin and death. You ushered in the day of grace so long foretold. Beloved Son of the Father, revered by the Magi, baptized by John, you came preaching and teaching, healing and comforting, forgiving and encouraging. You brought the gift of life to those walking in darkness and the joy of salvation to those doomed to death. Prince of Peace, shine like a beacon for us and the people of our world. Let the good news of salvation be heard in the remotest corners of the earth. Open our own lips to speak your name to those around us who still live without faith or hope. Arouse us and our missionaries to flood the world with the light of your gospel. Lord of the Church, let your peace rule our hearts that we may use our gifts to serve you and each other in willing gratitude and joy. Watch over our loved ones near and far that they may remember your love and rejoice in your salvation. Strengthen the faith of the sick and the disheartened. Give hope to those in despair and comfort those who mourn. Be gracious to all and lead us to reflect your love in everything we say and do. Hear us, Lord, as we bring your private petitions. Finally, bring us and all your believers to the heavenly home where we will stand in the full light of your glory and with all your saints and angels sing the everlasting song of triumph. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the singing of the next hymn.
please stand for prayer and the benediction. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. opportunity for us to gather together as God's people and to praise our Savior Jesus Christ you know sends us out into the world uh, just one announcement this morning it has to do with some fellowship opportunities our elder Mike Tagersley has some information for you Mike well we've been doing some thinking about fellowship activities with uh, spring right around the corner right that's how we like to think of it uh, so uh, first of all uh, uh, let's see as far as the calendar goes, Ash Wednesday is March 2nd. So we plan, uh, we, we plan to have a uh, supper at 6 o'clock, preceding the 7 o'clock Wednesday services during Lent, leading up to Easter this year. So we'll have a sign-up sheet and some more information about uh, how you can participate in that. Everybody will be welcome. So this would be every Wednesday at 6 o'clock before the 7 o'clock service, We'll have suppers during the Lenten season. We'll have a sign-up sheet for that later. Then on Easter, April 17th, we'll have a breakfast. That's the plan. We're going to have a breakfast before the Easter service. And I'm not sure about the times for those things yet, but of course the breakfast would precede the service on Easter Sunday. So, now, okay, ahead of all that, in three weeks from today, today's February the 6th, 
On the 27th of February, three weeks from today, we're going to have a chili cook-off. So there's a sign-up sheet. Just put it up there this morning. If you're interested in uh, participating, you can bring chili, you can bring sides, whatever else goes with chili. There's a sign-up sheet for that. But the bottom line is everybody's going to be invited. It will be after worship on February the 27th, Sunday, February 27th. Everybody's invited. I don't think I looked at anything else. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, there are refreshments available in the fellowship hall. If you'd like to stay and enjoy those with us. And a special welcome to all of you who are visiting with us today. It's been a pleasure for me to share the good news of Christ with you today. I hope you give me an opportunity to do that again soon. Have a blessed day. Be safe out there. Thank you.